Welcome to Practicing Connection, a podcast exploring the personal stories and collective practices that empower us to work together to improve our resilience and readiness in a rapidly changing world. Here to start the conversation are Jessica Beckendorf and Bob Birch. Hi, and welcome to the Practicing Connection podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Today, we'll be talking about investing in leisure, in learning, and in yourself, one of the eight ways of cultivating community resilience that we identified in our Connecting Communities in Asset-Based Community Recovery Project. In 2021, we worked with our colleagues, Bridget Scott and Cheryl Kniesel, to host interactive workshops with the purpose of providing a space to share our stories of community recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Participants in these workshops included military family service providers, extension educators, community development professionals, and others. Using the asset-based community recovery framework developed by Jonathan Messini and Heather Keem for the Tamarack Institute, we worked together to identify the interdependencies, capacities, and assets that had emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic response. The stories participants shared during the workshops helped point us toward what communities did really well in their recovery and what they could have done a little better. As we reflected on the incredible stories we heard in these workshops, eight themes for building individual and community resilience emerged for us. We're going to discuss each of the themes in a separate podcast episode. So far, we've talked about grounding yourself in your strengths and values making intentional and deeper connections, adapt, flex, and be resilient, and applying technology to community and community to technology. In this episode, we're going to discuss the theme, invest time in leisure, in learning, and in yourself. There's a growing body of research that has found both physical and social emotional benefits from taking part in enjoyable leisure activities, Participants in the asset-based community recovery workshop shared several stories about how they used the time that was made available to them as a result of the pandemic. Lockdowns and remote work allowed some people more free time, and they often invested that in themselves and their families. They took time to read more, to take newly available online courses, and to develop new skills, like the one participant who took the time to get their ham radio license, a valuable skill that that could be used during a disaster. Many others further developed their cooking skills. As one participant put it, viva la sourdough. Yeah, that was really funny. Several participants also mentioned a renewed connection with nature as socially distanced uh, outdoor activities were among the safest to do at the time. People accessed parks and trails that they hadn't visited before. Spending time in nature can promote mindfulness and improve our health. The time that they were able to spend resting, learning, and working on themselves was among the things gained during the pandemic that participants said they did not want to lose. However, hanging on to that time could be difficult. We risk returning to the hectic pace many of us have experienced before the pandemic as things return to quote unquote normal. Participants also highlighted the impact remote work has had on their work-life balance. While working from home can save time previously spent commuting, it can also blur the lines between personal time and work time. Participants both appreciated the flexibility of working at non-traditional hours and struggled with how that erased the boundaries between home and work. I think many of us understand the importance of making time for things other than work, But we're part of a culture that values work and productivity over family and community. Let's try to get more specific about some of the things we can think about when investing time in leisure, learning, and ourselves. Why don't we start with the idea of taking time to get to know ourselves better? This will help us recognize what we need to feel healthy and resilient. Yeah, this is something that I teach in some of my workshops, Um, and it seems to be something people simultaneously deeply want and also fear, the idea of, of getting to know ourselves better. It's so important to understand what we might need in order to take care of ourselves, like those boundaries, the, the things that we need uh, when we're feeling different 
feelings. Um, there are so many ways of knowing yourself better, ways of knowing ourselves in the moment, for example, such as knowing your emotions, but also doing the work of reflecting on where we came from, our experiences, our upbringing, and how these things affect how we navigate situations in life. One practice that's really powerful is digging into our personal stories. Where did you come from? What kind of neighborhood did you live in? What kind of socioeconomic status did you grow up with? What were some of your family and cultural norms? And then reflecting on how all of these things affect how you move through the world today. We have a whole journal we created that gets at some of some of these um, topics, and we'll place a link to it in the show notes. This was the Storytelling for Cultural Competence journal we did for the 2018 virtual conference. Yeah, we developed that that journal with those questions as a way of uh, helping you to kind of tap into um, that cultural competence and think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but I think they really fit here too. And knowing yourself, you know, can also help you invest time in leisure, in learning, and in yourself. You know, the the things that keep us from maybe investing in our investing time in ourselves might be things that we can discover and account for by taking the time to to know ourselves better and think about, you know, as you said, Jess, the ways that we're moving through the world um, and those ways might be affected by things that we are not consciously aware of. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'd like to move on to thinking about taking the stuff that we know about ourselves and using that to set goals for personal development. Um, I mean, you can set goals for personal development without doing that work, but I think it it's um, it really kind of propels your goal setting when you know yourself well enough to think about your personal development and what goals you might set for it. So um, when we're intentional and we set attainable goals, we're more likely to stay on a path that includes further investment in ourselves. You know, this one has been a little bit of a struggle for me uh, in the past. I'm interested in so many things and everything takes so much time to learn. <laughs> um, it's really easy for me to do the less intentional activity of just going down rabbit holes. It's really enjoyable, but when I crawl back out of the rabbit hole, I've lost hours. I may have gained some knowledge, but at some point I need to take some action and be intentional about setting a few goals related to the things that I want to learn and grow and do. One of the things that's worked for me uh, when I feel like I've really lost focus is remembering a quote from uh, Gretchen Rubin. I can do anything I want, but I can't do everything I want. I think of this as highlighting that I literally don't have enough time in the world to do everything I want, especially given the fact that I'm fascinated by and interested in so many things. I have to make choices. And I think it would seem logical to just choose one thing and go all in on it for a set amount of time, then switch to something else if I want to. Or I could decide to keep going for another set amount of time. You know, um, one of the uh, best tips I've heard about this is from a book called The Renaissance Soul. It's to choose one to two things to focus on for the next three months and then reevaluate that after the three months or or when you think it's not working for you, whichever is sooner. At the three-month mark, you can switch to a new thing. Or if you're still excited about it, you can continue on. That's what's worked for me because I am a person who has so many interests. Um, and I hate I hate that feeling of like, oh, if I choose this one or two things, I have to stick with those the rest of my life, right? For some reason, I felt I used to feel like goal setting was about that. And really, um, for me, that doesn't work. And so um, I know that there's other people out there like this who have so many interests. Um, so for me, it, what has worked is picking one or two things and saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go all in on these for a little bit of time, and then I'm going to reevaluate. And that has resulted in, you know, one to two long-term goals that um, I have met. I became a published poet as one of the, I mean, it was only one poem. So, <laughs> so it's not like I went crazy on it, but, um, but that was a goal that I set and I, and I accomplished from this kind of work on myself and from setting these goals and from um, allowing myself the freedom to decide to stop or to keep going with it. And I kept going with it. 
Well, congratulations on Thank the you. publication of your poem. It's interesting because I sort of, um, as you're describing going down rabbit holes and um, those kinds of things, I kind of have the opposite problem of, you know, being able to let go, let go of goals and expectations. You know, so I, I have a note that I, I keep for myself about reminding me to let go of those goals and expectations, you know, and saying you are not reading this so you can write a book, get a job or produce an output. You're just on a journey in process. So I kind of have the opposite problem where I maybe need to get away from the 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 focus a little bit uh more and do more do more exploring uh the the way that i've kind of dealt with that in terms of goal setting for personal development is to choose things that are a little bit foundational that maybe are going to affect more than one part of my life you know exercise practice you know supports all kinds of different personal development for me just by keeping me healthy and energized and and things like that my meditation practice kind of helps me i think foundationally you know just in terms of improving my mood being mindful of things like maybe i am you know stopping myself from going down a rabbit hole because i'm worried about whether it's relevant to what i what my goals are right now and and being able to kind of let go and allow things to happen so those kinds of foundational ones, foundational goals and practices um, are the things that I have my my personal development goals set around. You know, I, th I think also setting goals in this way can help us reframe the idea that we are doing things, quote unquote, for ourselves, you know, that it's somehow selfish, you know, as much as people remind us and you've probably heard guests on the podcast remind you that self-care is you know super important it's still called self-care and there's some of us me included might have a little bit of hang out hang up about it being selfish when we're doing things for ourselves and if we kind of use our personal development goals in this way and kind of think of it not as doing things for ourselves but practicing personal development we know that investing time in ourselves makes our communities better it better prepares our communities for for disasters and to recover from disasters investing time in ourselves you know makes us better service providers better co-workers better parents better partners better friends um and it also helps us support our colleagues and our families and our friends in their own development journey and that kind of in a fractal nature like as we it, as we develop ourselves and support the development of those immediately around us, that's a way of supporting the development of our of our community. So um, setting those goals, if that, that can help keep us on track with that personal uh, development, the development of people around us and, and the development of our community. I am so glad you brought that up. And I'm so glad that we had two different ways that we have been affected by, you know, our various interests and, and the ways we approach um, our own personal development and our our, pers our interests and our pursuits, partly because uh, I just wanted to bring up the fact that I also had to go through, a, I guess, a level of um, self-acceptance that that this is who I am. Um, that I'm the kind of person that's not interested in focusing on one or two things and becoming a massive expert on those things um, that I want to learn and do everything um, because I, I just felt often like a failure in the beginning when I was, when I was, you know, I was trying to do everything and um, I felt like, you know, what's wrong with me that I can't just stick with something. And the truth is that I actually often come back to those things, you know, maybe three, four years go by and then I'll come back and I'll continue learning it. And I had to accept that that's who I am and that that I like that about me. Um, right. I had to really explore and think about what, well, wait a second. I, I like this about myself. I like that. I, that I have a variety of things and I just, I guess I would encourage anyone else to, you know, as you're exploring how you do personal development and how you set your goals. Also think about how what your preferences are and how you prefer to approach personal development and goals and and um, allow yourself to accept and like who you are um, in that regard too. You know, another thing that came up in the in the workshops was the idea that we need to explore our boundaries too. You know, what boundaries we need to 
have in place to allow us to take time for ourselves. Um, if we don't have boundaries in place, it might be easy to prioritize whatever needs are the most immediate in the moment. Like I could take time to meditate right now, but my dog is wanting to be fed. That happens frequently, by the way. Um, or I haven't responded that to that email I received yesterday afternoon, so I can't meditate. You know, I have to set boundaries around that time. My early mornings is when I practice my meditation. Um, and that's my time for prioritizing myself. And I realize uh, using that language that I'm kind of tapping into that thing that might sound a little bit uh, selfish. So maybe we could, we'll edit that on the fly. Um, my early mornings are the time when I, that I dedicate to self-development, um, the personal development. And that helps me protect that time by setting that boundary. I've often uh, had difficulty with boundaries because I conceived of them as physical walls, as ways of kind of keeping things out, letting nothing in. And that can be helpful um, until you actually do let something in or let something across that boundary. And then it feels like it's a failure, right? That the wall has been destroyed. I have no boundaries. What's the point? Um, and I really like how uh, Heather Platt uh, has written about boundaries as a membrane. Heather wrote about having a boundary of that sets the, the space for yourself, you know, that's kind of around you. And when you conceive it as a membrane, that means that it's something that can change shape. So it can be expanded or contracted even in particular areas to fit, you know, what we need right now. And also a membrane can be selectively permeated, right? So it can let some things in and not others. And so we might let our partner or our kids permeate a boundary that we would never let, say, our supervisor through. And so that has really helped me think of boundaries as something flexible, and it's really helped me keep my boundaries in place. Yeah, I've, I've also found that metaphor to be really helpful as I think about boundaries, because it's also been a challenge for me to think of them as like these impermeable, um, inflexible things, you know, I certainly don't want to compromise my own resilience for the sake of flexibility, but also it's helpful for me to think about the membrane as a, as a metaphor for this kind of moving um, con contextual thing too, right? Let's talk a little bit about some action steps that can help um, you invest time in leisure learning and in yourself. First, Schedule time to do something you enjoy every day, if you can. Uh, taking even a few minutes a day to do something you really enjoy can boost your resilience. So set some time aside for it and keep that appointment. And um, if you can, savor it. You know, if it's something to be savored, take a moment to think about what what you're enjoying and loving and about it in the moment and what's bringing you joy about it and just savor it for, for that little, um, little bit of time. Yeah. Another step that we can take, as we talked about before, when we talked about goals is to set a goal for learning a new skill and again, schedule time to practice, right? When you're scheduling time, we kind of are setting, we're setting a boundary, right? Um, so practicing anything is great for resilience. It reminds us that we can always improve and give something new to work toward each day. Um, and it's a great reminder that, you know, over time our learning varies, right? We might have a good day of learning, we might have a bad day of learning, but we know that we have a goal that we're that we're working towards. One that I think is really important is to practice gratitude by letting someone in your life know what you appreciate about them, um, right? It's not just writing it in a journal, although there's lots of research behind how helpful that is. Um, I love this idea of connection by letting someone in your life know what you appreciate about them. Giving them the gift of gratitude helps deepen your connection with them, and it helps you see the social support system that keeps you resilient. Yeah, and I think it can also uh, get to that idea of how we support other folks' development, because when you give that gift of gratitude, especially if you give it specifically, that could really be the thing that keeps that person going on their own uh, personal development journey. Well, that's it for this episode. I want to thank you so much for joining us. You can keep up with Practicing Connection by subscribing to the podcast in your favorite podcast app and by joining the Practicing Connection community on LinkedIn. 
Visit oneop.org slash practicing connection to subscribe and join. Finally, we'd also like to thank our co-producer, Coral Owen, our announcer, Kaylin Goble, Hannah Hyde, Maggie Lucas, and Terry Meisenbach for their help with marketing, and Nathan Grimm, who composed and performed all the music you hear on the podcast. We hope you'll join us again soon. In the meantime, keep practicing. The Practicing Connection podcast is a production of one Op and is supported by the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the Office of Military Family Readiness Policy, U.S. Department of Defense, under award number 2019-48770-30366.